lovely darling viewers, it's Jen here at Check Her Joy. This time I'm reviewing the My Little Pony comics, Fiendship is Magic. So this is five single issue comics that each tell the, the origin story of one of the villains from the My Little Pony universe. They all have different writers and artists, um, but we're going to go through Sombra, T-Rex, The Sirens, Nightmare Moon, and Queen Chrysalis. I love villains and I love villain origin stories, so like I ate these out and love them. Some of them are stronger than others and I'll go through each of them individually but on the whole I gave the entire series 5 out of 5 stars even though all of them maybe didn't get 5 out of 5 stars individually. But the two strongest ones are Sombra and Queen Chrysalis like hands down. And yeah if you love My Little Pony, if you want to know more about the villains, if you love the comics, um, if you love any of these characters, I definitely dig into these. A few of them also have like other ponies showing up. So like Queen Chrysalis story has the main six. Um, the Sombra story is introduced with Cadence and Twilight. Um, so we're seeing the others. Obviously Nightmare Moon touches on Celestia. I mean they're sisters. It would be really weird if they didn't. Um, so we're seeing some of our favorite good ponies also but definitely getting to delve into these villains and what makes them villains and why they act the way they do a little bit. Some of them are more complete than others, but they all did what they could with, like, the space they had of, like, you know, 20 some pages. The complete list of writers and artists will be down in the description below. Getting into issue one is Sombra. It has writing by Jeremy Whitley and art by Brenda Hickey. And this one... This one starts off with Sombra as a foal, as a young pony. And he is found out in the wilderness around the Crystal Empire and is brought into the Crystal Empire and raised as if he were a crystal pony. Except that he's clearly not and so he doesn't necessarily get welcomed into the fold right away. He also doesn't have the background and experience and the learning that the other ponies of his age have. So he's a school-aged pony. Um, but he's also way behind in academics, behind his classmates. He doesn't interact well with others. His other classmates um, ostracize him. He's clearly not the same as them. And he's taken into this orphanage and raised. Um, but even living with other orphans, like he's still so different that he is an outsider. Um, and he desperately wants to be like the others. He's trying his hardest at school. And he does make one best friend in Radiant Hope who is this also really weird pony. She sees the world in a completely different light and um, basically seeing things. She has such an active imagination and she's just happy to have a friend and if Sombra's willing to go with it, then the two of them like become best friends because of that. But Sombra's also finding out exactly how different he is. The more light and love uh, touches him, the more he has like negative reactions to it, like it's actually hurting him to be close and to have friends and to um, feel the love in the Crystal Empire. So Sombra's backstory is heartbreaking and it's one of the reasons why it's one of the best is because there's just this tragedy in that there was a spark in him at one point where he could have gone a different way but because of his being a shadow creature, being this force of darkness that it wasn't ever in the cards for him. Um, so it's heartbreaking that he couldn't have what he wanted, which would have been to be a good pony. Um, so like I said, Sombra is definitely one of the best. Um, next up is Tyrek, and he's the minotaur that like absorbs other ponies' powers. So writing in this is by Christina Rice with art by Tony Flakes. Um, this one, we are going back to Tyrek's home country. So he is actually a prince. His dad is the king, but he has this power that his dad is like afraid of. And his dad's specifically afraid that Tarek is going to take over from him and just like wipe him out and like become too powerful. So he isn't training him. So Tarek finds somebody else who is willing to train him who happens to be this uh, evil centaur in the forest. And because he's the only one willing to give Tarek the time and train him, Tarek just latches onto him. So he's never given the chance to actually be good, basically, because his dad's ignoring him and his mom is kind of going along with it. Um, so Tyrek ends up going down this path because it's basically the only one 
open to him and for him to still have his powers and use them, which are clearly... I don't think there was ever a chance that Tarek wasn't going to use his powers. Um, <laughs> so he's studying under the Stark Wizard, um, and he has his brother who just, like, is happily going along and, like, I'm not so sure this is a great idea, but also you're my brother and I love you, so I'm going to go with it. Um, I love the brother. But basically, this is how Tarek gets in too dark and too deep. Um, he ends up turning on the wizard that has been training on him and becoming more powerful than him and then starting to develop this vendetta against Equestria and their magic and we really find out why Tarek is the way he is. Um, why Tarek took the specific path that he did, not that just he's dark, but like um, to get revenge on Equestria and uh, Celestia and yeah. This one also doesn't feel completely concluded. It's kind of left hanging there where like Tyrion is like I'm going to I'm going to overthrow my dad one day and I will get my vengeance. And you kind of get the vengeance on Equestria, but you there's this missing gap with what happens with his dad. <laughs> Cuz that's not something that we see in the show and it's not something I've seen in the other comics. I don't know if there's like one that I'm missing, um but like it, it isn't complete. All right. Issue 3, The Sirens with writing and art by Ted Anderson and Agnes Garbowski. Um, the Siren one is probably the the most meh. This is one if I was going to rate it by itself it would probably be three stars. It's fun but it doesn't really add much to it. Um, this one is following how the Sirens got from Equestria to in the Equestria Girls universe. And that's pretty much it for an origin story. They've already been doing their siren thing where they're going around and singing and absorbing ponies' powers and, like, life force or whatever it is they do. Um, they've already been doing that. But they decide they're going to go for the big time and go to Canterlot. And so they enter this music competition, and because the Canterlot ponies are, you know, Canterlot ponies, they are like, okay, is that all you got? And aren't impressed. So the sirens start coming up with new music and new ways, and it ends up being this battle <laughs> between... The sirens and Star Swirl the Bearded to try to come up with like the best music and win this competition and like um, save people's pony powers, I guess. Um, their life force. Uh, so that was fun. I feel like the, the thing is that I've read the Legends of Magic one, which I know comes after this, but it dealt with the sirens in a much better way that I like the Legends of Magic better, so I can't help but read the Fiendship is Magic Sirens episode or issue and be like, but you've done better with the Sirens, and so, like, I'm not really, eh. I do like the fact that this one deals a lot with, like, it's a Greek story. The Sirens are from Greek mythology, and we're bringing that into it. Canterlot feels like it's a Greek town. That's the ponies' hairstyles and outfits feel like they're Greek. We're dealing with this Greek myth. Um theme throughout it, we're basically getting the origins of all these different genres of music. Um, and that's the story the myth, the myth is trying to tell. So I kind of like that aspect of it, but I wasn't actually all that invested in the sirens themselves. Although we do have character development beyond the other two. So not just Ad Adagio, I think is the main one, but the other two have some character development. And I think it's Aria, who is like, I love music. And like, we really see her passionate about like creating new things. Um, I feel like if, if Arya weren't stuck with an Adagio, she might have, like, actually, she could go do something really awesome. But instead we have this trio that are, like, together, and together they're, they're maybe stretching their limits a bit. Issue 4 is Nightmare Moon. I love Luna. She is, like, my favorite pony. After, like, Twilight, who are, like, I literally am. So, like, Luna's the next best. Um, so I was super excited for the Nightmare Moon issue, which has writing by Heather Nuffer and Tony Flex on art and Fleeks. Um, and it tells the story of what happens when, when Nightmare Moon first gets to the moon. So we already know her origin story, how she's like Princess Luna's sister. We know how their big fight and why she gets banished to the moon. So really the only thing left to tell is what happens while she's on the moon. And while she's there, she she encounters these creatures called the Nyx, um, who create the dreams that the ponies in Equestria have. So when Nightmare Moon gets there, she starts 
seeing potential to cause some havoc and maybe uh, mess with her sister back on Equestria. Um, so the next, because they're manipulating dreams, uh, Nightmare Moon's plan is to manipulate Celestia's. But Celestia's magic is so strong that she can block them out and block out uh, Nightmare Moon. So like she's already anticipated this. She knows the Nicks are up there. She knows this could be a potential thing that's going to happen, so she's just going to block her out. But um, Nightmare Moon encounters one of the Nicks, whose name is Doran, who is just completely naive and is like, oh my gosh, your main, I'm like obsessed with your main. Which, to be fair, I am obsessed with Nightmare Moon's main also. Um, that's a totally legitimate reaction to her. Uh, but Nightmare Moon pretends to be her friend and uses her and manipulates her into teaching her how to uh, create dreams. And specifically how to create nightmares. And so we find out how Nightmare Moon can manipulate her and how Luna can get into dreams. Um, and so... And also it kind of explains why when Luna gets redeemed, why she would go through and try to remove nightmares, um, which I enjoyed. Like that that would be like the thing she felt worst about was the thing that she was doing the entire time she was on the moon. So maybe she needs to go remove people's nightmares now. And I love that aspect of Luna having read this comic. So basically we have Nightmare Moon trying to manipulate other ponies to get to Celestia and eventually they do end up having a showdown within the dream world where we have Celestia and Nightmare Moon uh, facing off. Um, obviously she doesn't escape the moon because, you know, obvious, otherwise the first couple of episodes wouldn't have happened. But it does bridge that gap into, like, what's happening on the moon. And it leads up into the, I think it was Nightmare Rarity. Like, there's, an, there's a story arc in the early uh, Friendship is Magic uh, stories where we find out what she's been doing on the moon and see, like, these ghosts of the Knicks and like what they became and we find out why they got to that point and what exactly Nightmare Moon did to them. Um, so Bridging Gaps is awesome. Okay, issue five is Queen Chrysalis. So this one is writing and art by Katie Cook and Andy Price. So it starts off with the main six going to visit Queen Chrysalis while she's in prison and then Chrysalis is telling these stories to them to kind of distract them and you can tell that maybe something is not quite right the entire time because Chrysalis never completely does anything just because, which I love about her. Um, we definitely get to see more of her character and how devoted she is to her hive that she's responsible for, but because because of her darker nature, she doesn't. she's not like I love you overly motherly in the way that we typically think of, but like she definitely does care for them her own way, and I love that about her. She tells four stories. The first one is about how she became a queen and why she took that title. She went from just being the master of the hive to like, I'm, oh, I like this crown, that's mine, I'm gonna take that, uh, which was fun and really one of the strongest ones. And the very last story is how the, how the changelings were created in the first place. And we find out that Chrysalis doesn't really, she never became evil, she was just born evil. She was born out of something really, really dark and how, um, that's why she is the way she is. Um, she never, never experienced love. They're, so they were just created to feed off other people's love. Um, and there's some bonus stories in there, which I just thought were like great extra uh, changeling stories. I guess they slowly add more parts, but I was just like so in awe of this entire issue and trying to figure out what Chrysalis was doing um, because we were seeing her in the cell and you can tell that something's not quite right. Um, and there's no way she would just be talking to Twilight, who she hates, and just telling her stories. She's, I mean, she's bored, but is she really that bored? Um, she's talking to Pinkie Pie, come on. So one of the stories revolves around this dragon that Queen Chrysalis encounters. And she's just, she's just like, oh, there's a dragon in the story. And like Fluttershy is like looking terrified and like, oh my god, it's a dragon. Um, and like, I think Rainbow Dash is like, oh, don't worry. There's no actual dragon here. And then Spike is like, I'm a dragon? What? Like, those little moments in... That's the reason why Katie Cook and Andy Price together are, like, my favorite combination, because they, they put in so many extra details. Like, most of the comics have extra details happening in the background, but the ones they do are so cute and tell us so much about the stories in just, like, one panel, or just, like, even the background of a panel, which I 
I adore about them. Queen Crystals was definitely the best and it's just they're such short stories I don't really want to spoil what those stories are but like I will Chrysalis has the best story the best issue not only because I love Chrysalis so much but also just legitimately the way it's told and the way it's interacting with ponies that we already care about um, but also she is so sinister and so dark it doesn't look like she could be redeemed in that way that the others have this like spark of where they like turned and decided not to do the right thing um, but Chrysalis never had that moment like we repeatedly see that um, and her only real devotion is to her hive which I loved so like I said the entire run was definitely five stars and like Chrysalis is on its own is amazing and so was Sombra's um so those were like the two best let me know in the comments below if you have read Fiendship is Magic and what you thought of these stories did you also rank them pretty much the same as I did um Chrysalis and Sombra I'm torn between whether T-Rick or Nightmare Moon are better because I like Nightmare Moon better but I feel like T-Rick is probably the better done of the two but they both are like missing something to make them amazing and then the sirens being like eh I like the Greek mythology tie-in I've been reading a lot of Lore Olympus so that was fun but like otherwise peace out I love you guys and keep reading bye